Hello folks, what I have in my hands is a beautiful cavalry carbine from the American Civil War. Probably the most interesting and probably the most famous of all. This is the Sharps percussion carbine. It's a capping breech loader, meaning that you open the breech, put in the cartridge holding the powder and the bullet together, and then after you close the breech, you cap it on the nipple separately, and then you can fire the gun. This is the forerunner of uh, all the modern time cartridges. About 25 years ago when I started shooting black powder, actually my second rifle was a percussion sharp sporting rifle. It was a repro. And to tell you the truth, I was not able to get it work. So after a few months, I sold it. It took me more than 20 years to get back into the percussion sharps business. And now I'm here with this original. So it's an interesting time for me. And great memories. <laughs> great memories, I can tell you that. So ladies and gentlemen, are you ready for the new time travel with your only one and favorite Gun channel in beautiful, bright Hanglish language. During the American Civil War, the cartridges were delivered to the soldiers in packs of 10, including 12 caps. This was the case for the Sharps percussion rifles and carbines as well. Today, most of the Sharps percussion rifle shooters are shooting the rifles with brass cartridges. They are easy to use, but absolutely not authentic. But we all know that feeding the sharps with paper cartridges or loose powder and ball has its limits. Be prepared that after several shots, the action will be clogged. Let's talk about the history of the Sharps Rifles. But before we do so, let me thank you for your support. Your donations through Patreon, or buying our American Civil War cartridge boxes, or our percussion revolver cartridge formers, or our US Arsenal Stadias, or the 19th century rangefinders, or our Arsenal label printing stamps, or our new products, which is a powder measure set, made according to the ordnance manual, they all help to keep the quality of our channel high. Without you, we would be in a much worse situation. Probably we would switch to broadcasting sleeping dogs or squirrels. Or anything. So thank you very much again. We know very little about the early ages of Christian Sharps. We know that he was born in 1810 or 11, and he worked in the rifle works of the Harpers Ferry Arsenal. This was led by John Hancock Hall. He was uh, responsible for developing the breech loader, the first ever breech loader to be adopted by the American army. This was the whole flintlock breech loader. And he was also responsible for developing uh, production processes, methods for making guns with interchangeable parts. This method, this know-how was also distributed to the different other arsenals as well. We know that Christian Sharps moved to Cincinnati in 1844, where he started his own business. His first patent was issued on the 12th September 1848, and he claimed two important novelties in gun manufacturing. It was a breech-loading design, of course, with a vertically falling block. First, he said that when you open the breech block, it falls down and opens the breech of the barrel completely. Second, when you close the breech, it will shear off the end of the cartridge, exposing the powder. He also claimed that the breech block is integrated with the nipple. His early rifles were already equipped with automatic capping devices as well. This capping system was later improved in 1852, when he integrated this capping device into the lock plate of the rifle. As usual, I start my shooting session with authentic reproductions of the original military cartridges for the Sharps. I'm not after hole-in-hole hole accuracy, but I would like to check the tactical accuracy. And I would like to see the reliability of the rifle. So let's start the business with some offhand 30 meter shooting.
it's good. <laughs> but that's what happens when you shoot the shops and you don't care how you close the breach. <laughs> this lady bites. But otherwise it's working. Very, very good. Ladies and gentlemen, that's offhand 30 meters and the first ever six shots with the Sharps carbine. And first it works, which delights me. I love that. Second, accuracy is not the best, but it's fair. <laughs> Let's do some more shooting. Sharps did not have a production capacity, so he teamed up with Albert S. Nips in 1849 to produce his first rifles. Nips produced around 250 rifles in both 36 and 44 calibers. These rifles already featured a slender breech, meaning that the face of the breech block was not perpendicular with the axis of the bore. This feature helped the block to cut the end of the cartridge. The real kickoff of the Sharps rifle was the establishment of the Sharps Rifle Manufacturing Company in Hartford, Connecticut in 1851. Sharps teamed up with George Penfield to create a factory that can produce large quantities of Sharps rifles. Sharps would be the technical advisor of the company, while he would receive a royalty after each and every single rifle made at this factory. Penfield never finished this facility, but in fact he teamed up with Robin and Lawrence to produce the Sharps rifles. Robin and Lawrence of Vermont had to create a factory that can produce 10,000 Sharps rifles a year. This company started work in 1853 in Hartford, Connecticut. This was the time when the first government orders came in. The Ordnance Department ordered 252 caliber carbines, out of which 150 was to be equipped with the Maynard style tape primer system. The Maynard tape primer was already in use on the model 1855 Springfield rifles, so it was obvious to add it to all the military rifles of the US Army. And this is my second shooting session, also with reproduction military cartridges at this time at 50 meters from a rest. After around 15 shots, I felt that the bridge block is getting fooled.
and that's 50 meters first time ever, well, all the five shots in the target, nearly at the size of the black area at 50 meters. Well, it's not terrible, but it's not good either. So we will need some load fine tuning in the future, but it's a good start. Let's check the velocity. The bullet I'm using is an authentic repro and the powder charger is also very close to the original. So it's a good chance to understand the external ballistics. The initial velocity is not too high, it's only 226 meters per second and the bullet retains 208 at 75 meters. Richard S. Lawrence and Christian Sharps never had a good relationship. In fact, the agreement was completely dysfunctional. So Christian Sharps left the company in 1852 when his labor contract was not renewed. And the connection between them was so bad that he even started a lawsuit against his former company in 1855. So actually we can say that all the Civil War Sharps carbines and rifles and all the falling block action, metallic cartridge rifles famous for the buffalo hunts and for the wild west, they were all perfected after Christian Sharps left the company. There were several inventions that contributed to the perfection of the Sharps cavalry carbines of the American Civil War. One was Hezekiah Conant's patent from 1856 that actually added a ring between the falling block and the barrel bridge to better seal the gases trying to escape at the joint. This improvement was later developed further by Richard S. Lawrence in 1859 when he attached this small ring to a plate. This is where we arrive to the most important part of the Sharps bridge block, the gas jack plate. The other element of the system was the self-adjusting bushing. This was technically a metal sleeve that was added into the powder chamber. And the idea was simple. It said that the gas pressures will force the gas plate, or the gas check forward against the end of the bushing, therefore they will together seal the joint perfectly. Idea was good, but it probably never worked. And regarding how the gas check seals the chamber, well, that's your proof. And with every single shot, I feel that my hair is burning. This is how you solve the problem of burning hair. You can easily become a very good hairdresser as well if you're shooting a sharps. Some water will help, but if you wear a flat cap or a baseball cut, now that's a much better idea, which I don't have now. Let's start again. I'm pretty sure that you noticed that my breech is spitting up and down a large amount of gas. My gas check is worn, of course, but to tell you the truth, this happens also when the breech block is fooled on a repro rifle today. But don't worry, this is absolutely normal. Sealing a breech without a brass cartridge case is impossible. So if you're shooting your sharps, wear gloves, glasses and long sleeve shirt. And here is a secret that only percussion sharpshooters know. Spit on your rifle if you want to make it work again. <laughs> Disgusting, isn't it? <laughs> yes, it is. So now I have 25 shots in the rifle and I did not have a misfire uh, and it's working properly. Of course the breech needed some spitting but, but that's fully acceptable on, on percussion sharps rifles. Well it's a neat little rifle, I, I really enjoy shooting this. No recoil, oh, okay very low recoil and it's very comfortable, very comfortable. I don't say it's the best design, it's quite interesting that it's rather than spitting downwards it's spitting upwards. I always feel my hair is is, uh, is flying when I shoot the rifle and there is only very few paper particle that remains in the chamber. Look at that. This was from the last shot. This was from the last shot. You can just blow it out from the direction of the muzzle easily. But otherwise the concept is good and I pretty much understand why it was so revolutionary by the middle of the 19th century. And the action is really strong. I, I have to agree that the action is very, very strong. But from this point, the Sharps rifles were never manufactured with the slant breech, because for this system to make it work, it had to be a completely vertically falling block action, like 
the one we know today as a Sharps percussion breech loading carbine. During the Civil War, more than 9,000 Sharps rifles and more than 80,000 Sharps cavalry carbines were bought by the US Ordnance Department. But this rifle was also used by the Confederacy as well, as this was the largest number war booty cavalry carbine available for them. And they also manufactured their own illegal version by S.C. Robinson. They made 5,200 pieces altogether. The reputation of the Sharps breech loader was probably the best among all the cavalry carbines during the American Civil War. Major Thompson of the First Iowa summarized his opinion the following way. Sharps carbines have no superior. In range, it is fully equal to a Minier rifle, and the facility and accuracy with which it is loaded and discharged renders our dismounted cavalry more than equal to the enemy infantry and far superior to their cavalry. Breech loaders were not new in the American army when the Civil War broke out, and it is still interesting that they excluded them completely from the cavalry tactics. Cook cavalry tactics of 1862 only deal with the saber and the revolver as the arms of the cavalrymen. This is quite interesting as the mounted rifleman concept was very strong in the American continent. In fact, the Civil War conflict showed that the cavalry has to have the same firepower as the infantry. In fact, the only cavalry concept that survived was the dragon concept. But this lesson was learned very, very slowly. It lasted well till the second half of the First World War. This is the second day of shooting, and I'm searching for a more accurate load for my rifle. I reduce the original 60 grains of 1.5F powder to 40 grains. The distance is 50 meters again. Okay, so that's 50 meters with 50 grains of one and a half F powder and some filler in the cartridge. The group actually shrinked, so if I'm good to myself, I would say it's within the nine ring, which is uh, which is quite okay for a paper cartridge. Mm -hmm. And we have the marks of grease at the bullet holes, which means that lubrication of the bullets is quite good. There were four versions of Sharps cavalry carbines delivered during the American Civil War. The first version was the model 1859. This model is easily recognizable by the hinged patch box in the, in the buttstock. Around 27,000 pieces were delivered from these rifles. The next batch was the model 1863 version with nearly 60,000 pieces. It was delivered until 65 and there are only minor differences between the two rifles. One is the missing patch box, so you can be sure that this is a model 1863 version. The last batch was the model 1865, which is technically the same as the model 1863. There were 
5,000 pieces delivered from this. My Sharps rifle is a model 1863 carbine. It's an old workhorse, showing intensive use. The serial number range of these rifles were between 75 to 140,000. The C in front of the serial number on the tank indicates that my rifle is a late production of this batch. On the buttstock I have unit markings from Company E, probably from the 2nd Regiment. The overall condition of the carbine is good. The bore is also good but it shows some pitting. The breech block is heavily worn. The gas check plate shows signs of extensive use, therefore the seal of the breech is imperfect. The rifle has all the appropriate markings. The rear sight is graduated to an over-optimistic 800 yards. The front sight is a German silver blade. The length of the bore is 22 inches and the nominal caliber is 52. The rifling has 6 grooves and lens and the twist is right hand, one turn in 48 inches. And of course the lever has a safety for cavalry use. There is a bit of confusion with the caliber of the Sharps rifles. The US Army purchased 52 caliber Sharps carbines and rifles. They were fed with 54 caliber cartridges. While the US Navy purchased 56 caliber Sharps breech loaders. Let's talk a bit about the operation of the Sharps rifles. According to the original manual of the Slant Breach Sharps rifle, the loading and firing had to be the following way. To load. Move the lever guard forward, insert the cartridge and press it smartly with the thumb, then return the lever to its former position and the arm will be loaded. If desired, insert the ball at the breech, force it to its seat with a rod and charge with loose powder. This is my third 50 meter session. This time with cartridges loaded with 50 grains of 1.5F powder and some corn as filler. So the first round was the 40 grains, I mixed up the two cartridges, uh, this was the 50 grains and the group opened up quite large. And uh, also I feel that, the, that the, the falling in the action is, is getting stronger and stronger, so it is getting harder to operate the rifle, but it still works. With the 40 grains there was no recoil and the group was quite tight, so this will be the good direction in finding the most accurate load for the original Sharps Cavalry Carbine. According to the manual, the pellet primer system had to be loaded with a tube, little tube holding 20 to 30 priming pellets. The diameter of this little brass disc is 4.8 millimeters and the thickness is around 0 0.8, 0 0.9 millimeters. This is only a dummy, of course, this is not working. So this is actually how the device was loaded. First you full cock your rifle, then you open the cover, you put your little priming device into the hole, like that. You push the wooden piston down, then you filled all your caps or pellets into the tube, then you engage the cutoff bar, which will, which, which will prevent the pellets from uh, being fired out upwards by the springs before you close the lid. And then you close the lid and your rifle is ready to fire. Upon firing, the primer threw a pellet between the nipple and the hammer. And also according to the manual, 
Of course, after each shooting session, the rifle had to be cleaned properly and oiled properly, with special care taken to the bushing in the breech to prevent corrosion. The original Sharps rifle manuals described an easy way to produce the cartridges for the rifle. Cut the papers after the cut above presented, then place the cartridge stick on the paper and roll the paper in a tubular form, with the end projecting over the stick enough to admit the balls as far as in the first collar. Then put a little gum arabic paste in the end of the paper tube and insert the ball and choke it around with a cord, then withdraw the stick and charge with powder and fold it the ordinary way. But during the Civil War, the soldiers were not rolling their own cartridges for the Sharps rifles, but they were issued cartridges that were manufactured by private contractors or by the arsenals. The only bullet in service at the beginning of the conflict was the so-called old style bullet. This had a ring tail to be able to tie the end of the paper case of the cartridge to the bullet. According to the Ordnance Board meeting in 1854, the cartridge looked the following way. The ball used in this gun is solid, oblong in shape and weights about 455 grains. The cartridge is made in the ordinary manner, except that the paper is tied on the projection in rear of the ball. Weight of powder is 65 grains. The cartridge end was folded the traditional way and it was longer than the chamber. So when the breech was opened, the cartridge was inserted and when the breech was closed again, the gas check sheared off the end of the cartridge and exposed the powder. These cartridges performed well on ordnance trials, but they tended to break open in long transports. So by 1860, the Sharps Rifle Manufacturing Company recommended a new style of cartridge for their rifles. These cartridges were rolled in linen or paper cases. They were shorter, the end was in flush with the chamber end. The caliber ranged from 53 to 55 and the bullet weight from 480 to 520 grains. These cartridges were more solid in construction and they also limited the fooling of the breech block as there was no spilling powder. In 1864 a new device was also manufactured for this cartridge manufacturing process which was a choking device. It was designed by John S. Adams and patented in 1864 for choking the end of the paper cartridge into the ring of the bullet. By the summer of 1863 a new type of cartridge was available for the Sharps percussion breech loading rifles. These cartridges were made by the Hazard Powder Company and also by Johnston and Doe, and they were made with the collodion compression process, which means that a small pellet of black powder was attached to the base of the bullet. This did not need any paper or linen envelope. The Ordnance Department loved this new concept, as the linen cartridges tended to leave some unburnt linen in the chamber, while the paper cartridges were vulnerable. The bullets I use for my historical shooting are cast from the Erascon Confederate Sharps mold. This is an excellent healed bullet, which is easy to use for cartridge making. The process starts with rolling the case. The length of the paper is your chamber length, and the paper has to be wide enough to be able to roll it twice around the mandrel. This is normal wrapping paper, not flash paper, just as it was in the case of the original cartridges made according to the ordnance manual. Now comes the closure. Apply some glue to the end of the cartridge case. This is thin tissue paper. Now comes the military powder charge, 60 grains of 1.5F Swiss powder. And now your cartridge is ready. It will have to be deep lubed before use. The original lube suggested by the original manual was bayberry tallow or tallow. 
This kept the barrel from leading and ensured good shooting. And this is my fourth 50 meter shooting session. I reduced the charge to 36 grains of 1.5F powder and 24 grains of corn as filler. And that is 36 grains of one and a half powder with the same bullet, which means that probably we reached the, the, the maximum performance, performance of this rifle at 50 meters. It's a good group, no problem with that. Of course, it's an old rifle and you cannot expect hole in hole from this bore, but otherwise it's good. The Confederate Army also used a large number of Sharps carbines and rifles, which means that they had to tool up for the production of the Sharps carbine cartridges as well. They used the old style cartridges, which means that they used the, the ring tail bullets with uh, attaching the envelope of the paper cartridge with gluing or with tying to the base of the bullet. And the end of the cartridges, the tail of the cartridges were folded like in the ordnance manual. The percussion sharps rifle was not the best design of the American Civil War. It was not the best, but not bad at all. But it could easily be converted after the war to fire, center fire metallic cartridges. And in fact, we still use these rifles today for hunting with a great joy, as they can handle high pressure modern cartridges as well. But why do we love the sharps rifles today? Well, first of all, because of Quigley Down Under movie. If you are a grown up man, and you have seen the movie, then sometimes in your life you must have a 45 caliber metallic cartridge firing breech loading sharps rifle because otherwise you won't have a complete life.
Second, we love these rifles because there are plenty of repros available. Pedersoli and Shiloh, for example, are making excellent repros for you that are absolutely competition grade guns. And third, this is the only military rifle ever to be equipped with a coffee grinder. Walter King of the Force Mystery State Militia Cavalry designed and added coffee grinders to the model 1859 carbines they had. There are only 12 pieces existing. And today there's a consensus, consensus that uh, this is probably not a coffee grinder at all, but it was designed for grinding corn. But you know what? Who cares? It's a beautiful addition. So ladies and gentlemen, thanks for tuning in to the Cap and Ball channel again. I really hope that you enjoyed the show and uh, be prepared for more Sharps content on the channel later in the future. If you wish to support us, the link to the Patreon site to the capandball.com website where our webshop is and our eBay store are listed in the description. So ladies and gentlemen, until next time, stay cool and keep your powder dry.